two years ago, I had an idea. I wanted to learn to 3D model like an architect. So I decided to learn the software called Grasshopper. It costs about $1,000. Grasshopper is a really good tool when an architect wants to make buildings with these kinds of alien, chunky, flowy shapes. Now, I like how these buildings look, but I didn't want to make a building. It would be too much work. But I did want to get good enough with Grasshopper that I could create cool designs, but on a much smaller scale. Like these shoes for my wife that I could 3D print in my home. Here's how an architect would use Grasshopper to program a building. Imagine you had to write a set of instructions to build a building. You make it 20 feet wide, 10 feet tall, put a second story on it, etc. This software is like that, but instead of writing code like a caveman, you wire up all these little nodes on this side, and then the 3D representation of those nodes appears on this side. With just a handful of these building blocks, someone can make very powerful patterns and programs. Architects learn how to use this software in school. However, I'm not an architect. So I watched some YouTube tutorials and practiced until I figured out how I could make my wife some one-of-a-kind shoes. It took about two years to figure it all out. Let's see how it went. I decided to start with something easy, a cube with dots. How hard could it be? So I typed in the word cube, but that's obviously not it. Prism? Rectangle? Box, yeah, yeah, box, that's the one. Yep, okay, where's my box? It's painfully obvious I have no idea how to use the software, because I don't see a box anywhere. It took me seven minutes of random button pressing, but eventually I found the box. Ta-da! I was able to quickly put a bunch of dots on it, but that's when I found myself with a new problem. I could see the box, but I couldn't interact with it. It was like a tantalizing half-vended hot pocket. I eventually asked the internet and it told me to look here. So I right-clicked the component and found the fourth option, conveniently labeled with a fried egg icon and the word bake. So, bake an egg I did. A quick render later, and I was done with my first project. It only took a few hours. Now, why am I learning Grasshopper? Every piece of 3D modeling software has its strengths. Some are really good at making organic things, like monsters and aliens, stuff you'd see in a movie. Some are really good at making precise real-world things, like robot arms and power plants. Rhino is a software that's kind of in the middle typically good at making beautiful shapes like jewelry, cars, and yachts that still need to be precisely manufactured. In 2007, David Rutten made a little program that sits on top of Rhino called Grasshopper. The small blocks I've been wiring up in Grasshopper are telling the underlying Rhino software what to do. Architects are the main users, make gigantic buildings. Again, buildings aren't really my thing. So let's get looking at these shoes and these faces because I think I can do something cool there. So for my next project, let's talk about my 3D printer which, contrary to popular belief, can actually only print two things, unlicensed intellectual property and vases with cool patterns. A vase it is. I obviously don't know what I'm doing, so I wrote a quick tutorial, created a curve in space, revolved it, and put a cool stripey pattern on it. Then I thickened it so that I could 3D print it if I wanted to. I decided to get serious and found a series of really good YouTube tutorials by Nick Sensky. I followed along in the construction of an above ground swimming pool, an artful arrangement of home plates, a porcupine Christmas tree, and a twisty churro. Six hours well spent. With my newfound confidence, I decided to make an octopus tentacle, as it's curvy but has a geometric pattern on the bottom. There you go, another six hours followed by six more as I work through some more tutorials. On to my first real project. At the time, I had a Christmas tree stand that refused to do the job for which it was created. Over the course of a holiday season, the tree fell on me or a family member no fewer than four times. I decided to make some wedges to hold the Christmas tree stand in place. Each wedge would have a different pattern. The plan was to harness the power of all four patterned wedges in order to bring balance to the Christmas tree. I actually wanted the wedges to work, so I had to be very careful with modeling to make sure everything was accurate. Here I am playing around with a randomized function to help create the cellular pattern. One of the benefits of this programming-based approach is that I can get very organic looking results by having a computer randomize the inputs for me. Then if I want the structure bigger or smaller, or just different, I simply adjust a few inputs. The second wedge uses a blocky square texture made popular by the hit game Minecart. 
I created a three-dimensional array of squares and then told the computer to remove all the squares that didn't intersect my previous model. I could then adjust some of the tolerances to get the effect I was looking for. I wanted to see how these looked in the real world, so I started printing them. The next wedge had a triangular low poly effect. Nothing too interesting here, so I'll just skip the explanations. Now, for the final wedge, I wanted to play around with these organic flowing lines. These are really hard to get right in traditional 3D CAD modeling programs, which can cost several thousand dollars and are usually only good for making useless things like brackets, gears, screws, and MRI machines. I did print all of these out, however, it took me so long to finish this project that my wife, having been on the receiving end of a conifer more times than she would prefer, had already replaced the Christmas tree stand with something else. So, I turned them into designer doorstops. Continuing on the theme, I created some pattern dials like you'd see on a wall-mounted thermostat. I made a bubbly pattern and a crisscrossy line pattern. I was still intrigued by that flow pattern from the last doorstop, so I wanted to explore it some more. I wanted the lines to wrap all the way around the cylinder. I did this by making the lines on a flat surface, then asking the software to kindly project those lines onto a cylinder. This time I programmed the lines to be randomly generated. And you can see them make a cool bird's nest shape. While playing around with these, I had a happy accident and turned on two sets of shapes at once. I really like how the two sets of lines intersect randomly. If you just blew this up and cut the edge bits, it would make a really nice football stadium. I should also tell you, I have many hours of experience with other 3D modeling software. So for me, learning Grasshopper is kind of like someone who speaks Spanish learning Italian. Lots of similarities, but definitely two different languages. Next up was a baby bottle. I've designed a few of these professionally and wanted to play around with a faded diamond pattern. Instead of showing you the time lapse of how it all came together, I'll show all the different ways I messed it up. To understand how I could get visually spectacular failures like these, let's pretend I have nine squares, A through I, and each corner is labeled one, two, three, and four. If I wanted to put an X inside each square, I'd tell the software, take A1, connect it to A4, take A3, connect it to A2, and so on. Works great, each square gets an X. However, let's pretend I'm a wildly overconfident beginner, and I just mess the instructions up, and I connect all the ones together. I'm gonna get a huge mess. Now add an extra dimension to this, a lot of extra squares, and you can see how things can start to go terribly wrong in a hurry. Enjoy the show. I had definitely bit off more than I could chew on this one, but I ended up learning about how Grasshopper handles lists of data, which is really helpful. I could have done this in a quarter of the time with another software, but in the end, I had an adjustable pattern and the final result looked professional. If you saw my previous video where I tried to learn to use a 3D pen, you may remember this failed attempt at a faceted triangular vase. I came to the conclusion that my design intent would be better realized with a more precise instrument, like a 3D printer. So I set out to model that vase using Grasshopper. It was easy enough to make the form, and then have Grasshopper turn it into a triangular tessellation. I wanted to print this vase off on my 3D printer, but my printer only prints one color at a time. So I'd have to print all the triangles out of white material, the vase out of red, and then assemble everything together. How would I know where to put the white triangles? I created three sets of matching features some round pegs, some square pegs, and some matching numbers to identify which triangle goes where. This is where I felt I really used the power of the software. Hand modeling and placing all these features on all these triangles cut at all these different angles would be almost impossible in a traditional CAD software program. It wasn't easy in Grasshopper, but it did give me great results. The cool part is that once assembled, all the keying in numbers are hidden. I arranged the triangles so they could be 3D printed and then randomized the inputs until I found a well-proportioned vase. A few hours on the 3D printer later, 
and had a super accurate vase. Much better than my 3D pen version. It took about two hours to assemble everything. Some of the numbers were rotated and mirrored and backwards, so it was tricky to find the correct triangles. I later went back and fixed my code. I used hot glue to really hold everything in place. I tried to make everything just press in place, but found it hard to maintain tight tolerances with so many parts and angles. While I'm putting this together, I should note that McNeil, the company that makes this software, didn't sponsor this video and was no way involved in this production in any capacity. I bought the software with my own money. Speaking of money, it's time to introduce you to the channel's first sponsor, Build a Skill. That's me. When I first showed the vases to my wife, she had this to say. Hey, build a skill that looks good. Really? Yeah, I really like it. So, I spent some time creating additional silhouettes and tweaking the print files. Eventually, I created 16 different sizes. I printed several versions of each size to refine the tolerances. By simply changing the colors that you print, you can create entirely different moods to match whatever you're trying to do. I also took some time to set up some detailed instructions. For less than the price of a frozen yogurt in a major metropolitan area, you can have the entire collection. All of the tiles are arranged to fit on most common printer beds and are ready to be sliced. If that last sentence didn't make any sense to you, then you don't own a 3D printer and these files are not for you. And, just like your favorite Froyo shop, a sample version is available if you like to try before you buy. These make great presents. If you like the person you're giving the vase to, you can assemble it together as a fun activity. Now, if you don't like the person that you're giving this to, you can assemble the vase beforehand so you don't have to spend any time together. All income generated by sales will be used to fund my dairy habit. Let's talk about my wife's shoes. They were designed by someone who isn't me, which is sad and boring. Time to change that. I used two pairs of shoes that she particularly likes as the basis of my exploration. I tried to avoid strappy patterns, instead focusing on something more monolithic. I wanted to put some cool stripes on it and some large blocks of contrasting colors as well. To meet my biannual video upload deadline, I had to keep the project effort relatively limited, so I budgeted out how much time I thought it would take. After adding up all the steps, I estimated it would take about 70 hours. Let's see how I do. I used a graphics software to draw some lines over my sketch, trying to figure out approximate dimensions and proportions. I was really liking these flowing lines from my previous projects, so I figured why not and stayed on theme. I drew both a top view and a side view of the shoe, took a screenshot of each, and then imported them into Rhino. Using these two views as a foundation, I created other curves through 3D space. I then imported all of those curves into Grasshopper. That way, if I wanted to make this shoe in a size 12 men's or something like that, I could simply change the input lines and the design would update automatically. I then mapped out a series of curves on the surface of the shoe. For this first pass, I wasn't able to get everything just quite right, but I was able to get it close, which gave me some confidence that the final results would look good. While we're watching the rest of this, I should give my brief opinion of the software. This entire video is like an unpaid infomercial, showing what is awesome about Grasshopper. Basically, if you dream it, you can build it. I like Grasshopper. That said, there are four things that I would change, with some suggestions on what to improve. I'll keep it short. Number one, improve the booleans. Number two, improve the selection tools. Number three, help new users out by defaulting to icon and text labels. And number four, improve the documentation. Now, back to the shoe. It's at this point that I realized that being an architect is actually super easy. Take a fun shoe, blow it up really big, add a couple of trees, a couple of clouds, maybe draw some people walking a dog. I'm not saying it's gonna get the Pritzker prize or anything, but you never know. I'm going to 3D print these shoes, which means I'll need to order some colored filament. I'm partial to the reds and blacks, but my wife is more adventurous with her fashion and wanted an electric yellow and blue set of shoes, which ended up being 100% the right choice. It both looks good in a YouTube thumbnail and provides excellent night visibility when jogging. From here, I played around with the tread on the bottom of the shoe. I wanted to try out this Mailstorm component, which would turn the bottom of the shoes into a cool hurricane type of pattern. Then brought everything into another software to combine all the parts together. Finally, the left shoe was finished. I wasn't looking forward to starting from scratch on the right shoe. But then I remembered. My wife is bilaterally symmetric, and I could use the mirror command to create the right shoe, saving me hours of work. I 3D printed a prototype of the shoe. 
Here I am telling my 3D printer where it should place support material so that the shoes don't collapse inward while printing. You'll see the design is generally vertical, like a pillar. However, there are some curves over the top of the feet that will need to be supported, or gravity will have effect, ruining the part. This is a first prototype to evaluate fit, so I used some white material I had laying around. The lower parts took about 12 hours to print, the upper parts took about 24 hours. The upper was made from a flexible material, which can be difficult to print. I was pleased that there were no major failures. I had to do some hand work and drilling on the prototype, but eventually had something that my wife could try on. I didn't actually get video of her trying it on, and she was out of town when I edited this. So I hope you don't mind that I reenacted the fitting for you. Thanks, build a skill. It's a good start. Few things that need to change. One, it feels like I'm standing on a plastic shoe. Two, it's too small. Three, it feels like my foot is going to slide off the front of the shoe. Four, stop playing around on that silly computer. Let's go get frozen yogurt. I'm buying. I should have done it earlier, but to fix the fit issues, I simply scanned my wife's foot and leg, which is both easier and harder to do than I thought. Easier because I could do it with a cell phone, and harder because my wife's legs are not detachable, and her other pesky foot kept getting in the way. It's at this point that I have to come clean with you, the viewer. The entire video was just an excuse to make one of these. To get a better fit, I was able to adjust the input curves in Rhino and Grasshopper updated accordingly. After this, I spent some more time refining the cross structures that hold the entire shoot together. This video may make it look like everything came together super easily, but I spent at least 12 hours of my life adjusting and rebuilding those vertical uprights. It was hard to get them to flow nicely along the surface without the whole model breaking or leaving weird gaps. The tread was also reworked with a series of random triangular pegs that would fit into random triangular holes. These are slightly recessed, so they're not really visible from the bottom of the shoe. You'll remember my wife said that she felt like she was gonna slide off the front of the shoe. I attempted to add a thin, flexible grip, but it was all too uncomfortable to stand on. To fix this problem, I decided to make a really thick insole out of flexible material, then have the printer sparsely fill it. By playing around with the fill pattern and density, I could dial in the correct feel. Like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, the first attempt was too soft, the second too hard, and the third just right. With these last changes completed, I was ready to print the final version of the shoe. Again, even with two printers going full-time, it took quite a while to print all the parts. Here is everything laid out. This upper is made from flexible material. This lower is also flexible. The thin, flexible tread fits into the plastic sole and is then glued into place. Likewise, the soft insole is also glued in. This prototype involved a lot less hand cleanup around the holes and press fit into place fairly easily. The goal was to have the upper and lower look like they're one continuous piece, through a couple of tricks. I used a soldering iron to bore some holes for the shoelaces, and to smooth out a bunch of surprisingly sharp blobs of plastic left behind by the 3D printer. I then assembled both the top and the bottom, hiding the seam inside the blue part of the shoe. After lining everything up, I used some super glue to stick it all together. I ended up using a whole bottle between both shoes. The tread glued on in a similar manner. In the end, my original estimate of 70 hours was actually pretty close. This project was much, much more involved than any of the others, but in the end, was definitely worth it. I'm really happy with the shoes. My wife agreed to model for me, so we went out into town to get some shots. I asked her what she thought. Build a skill. These look great and are so comfortable. Sometimes I even forget that I'm walking in a heavy plastic shoe. All joking aside, she really liked the shoes. I have to admit, they're not comfortable, but I am very pleased with how they look in real life. Definitely a statement piece. Before you ask, there's no way I'd sell these, because to get them to the point where I could charge money for them would probably take about 150 more hours of work. However, if you're lucky enough to wear one of these two shoe sizes, and don't mind wearing uncomfortable and potentially injurious shoes, you can download the files and make them in whatever color you'd like for free. This video took a long time to make, but now I've acquired a new skill that I can use professionally. It was a lot of fun and gave me some good ideas for the next video. Please consider subscribing. 
It would be a shame if someone else saw the next video before you.